my thing with San Jose State University. It, it is actually a tremendous surprise. I found this out last year when we set up uh, this event, that San Jose State boasts one of the more, uh, I won't say conservative, but one of the economic uh, departments where the professors actually believe in economic freedom and liberty. This is, it was a great shock to me, but it's true. And we have today the chairman of the Department of Economics, the chairwoman of the Department of Economics, who has been the chair for the last 10 years. Her name is Dr. Lydia Ortega. She's a professor of economics. She has her doctorate from George Mason University. Those of you who listen to Rush Limbaugh often get to hear Walter Williams fill in for, for Rush. Walter Williams was a distinguished professor of economics at George Mason and was himself a professor for Dr. Ortega. So she comes from a spotless lineage of economic liberty and a classical liberal view on economic freedom. Dr. Ortega is the co-founder of the Hispanic Women's Club of Silicon Valley and the co-founder of the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. And we're very pleased to have her today to speak to us about some economic and legal issues relating to the Tea Party and our values. Dr. Ortega. with the gentlemen who were just up here, why aren't you in economics? We need you to help rebuild the country, not to build more buildings. Wow, it is truly fantastic to be here. I have to confess that it was in 2008 that I lost my protest virginity here. Uh, and <laughs> it's true. Never had a reason to come out and protest in all my life. But in 2008, I was out here with you guys and I'm so happy to be yeah. here again. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna talk about debt and deficits and throw all kinds of numbers at you. I'm gonna have a very uh, short talk, but about something very important. Because if we fix the debt and if we get it down to a reasonable amount and if we reduce the size of the government, we will still have a problem. There is some other disease that is very corrosive, that's not getting enough attention, and that can destroy the country that we love. And that disease is an erosion of the rule of law. Yes. What is the rule of law? You heard some mention of it with the prior speakers. If I get hit with a flag. <laughs> An exact definition is debatable. I remember one very sleepy academic conference when everybody suddenly woke up because there were two professors arguing uh, loudly about what the rule of law was. And the professor from China said vehemently, we have the rule of law in China. We have laws. How else will we know how to go around, over, or under these things? How else could we identify who to bribe? Now, that's not the rule of law I'm talking about. That debate, that argument, was really over two little letters. The professor was from China was talking about the rule by law, B-Y, not the rule of law, O-F. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time making sure you understand the distinction. We'll have a working definition, and then we'll talk about some examples because they're out there and they're insidious they're sneaky, and I want to make sure that if there's one thing I give you, it's the ability to see them more clearly when they uh, are out there. So can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Okay, good. So under rule by law, the law is used as a tool of governing and controlling people. The highest officials are always above that law. This is called rex lex, where the king is law. Under the rule of law, the law restrains the government by promoting certain liberties, and it restrains the government by creating order and predictability regarding how a country functions. This is also called lex rex. The law is king. Millions of people have immigrated to the United States, and they have thrived because we had a strong rule of law. 
It didn't matter who you were or who you knew. You could accomplish what you wanted when the law is king. If you needed help understanding something, you hired an assistant, you hired a lawyer. But the lawyer worked for you. He did not have power over you. There's a big difference. I was having a discussion with a good friend from China, and he says that Chinese immigrants or expatriates have contributed financially a lot of capital to develop the infrastructure in southern China. I said, really? How did they do that? Why would they do that? They have no property rights, no guarantees. Well, he said there's two reasons. One is they, they love their country. I said, okay, that's gonna buy you a little bit more risk taking. The other, he said, was that they always get a government official to be on the company board. Okay, well that explains it. Now notice what happens once you have government officials securing your property rights. You don't want the government to change because if it changes, your property, your toll roads, your bridges, they're all gonna be taken away. Plato had this to say about the law. I'm gonna read it slowly because it's Plato. Where the law is subject to some other authority and has none of its own, the collapse of the state, in my view, is not far off. But if the law is the master of the government and the government is its slave, then the situation is full of promise and men enjoy all the blessings that the gods shower on a state. All the blessings that the gods shower. You see that the rule of law is intimately connected to economic growth. And there have been many studies showing that a nation with high economic freedom has robust economic growth. The single most significant variable that makes one nation more free than others is a strong rule of law. And so let's have this working definition. The rule of law is a system that protects the rights of citizens from the arbitrary and abusive use of government power. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. All right, now let's see how the rule of law, lex rex, is being eroded and leading to an arbitrary and abusive government. Today is tax day, right? Well, our tax law is too complex, and that complexity is undermining the values that we place on the rule of law. Try as you might, folks, you're probably violating some code here or there. You can take five different experts and give them the same question about a tax situation and they will give you five different answers. So if it's not possible to get a clear right answer, a single right answer, then you are constantly exposed to peril every time you genuinely try to fill out your tax forms. So complexity is one way that we erode the rule of law. Oops, where's the other one? Ah, here's my favorite, the auto industry in May 2009. Okay, this is where government stepped in and completely abrogated the bankruptcy laws. And it took from the bondholders who invested in a secure uh, option, who took lower rates of return for that security, and it took those rights and gave most of them, most of the equity, to the UAW. Okay. Clearly, this is a complete ignoring of our rule of law. Uh, and you know what? I didn't ask this government or any government to be my investment broker. And somehow I now have GM stock for what it's worth. <laughs> there is another element that constantly erodes the rule of law or is possible when you ignore it and that's crony capitalism and on this one i'm going to talk about one that's a little bit uh, less clear how about those fluorescent versus the inca incandescent light bulbs <laughs> hey that's what my mom said 
back in the 70s, when the price of electricity was going up, she told the four siblings, turn off the lights. And she put up signs right next to the light switches by the door. Okay. You would have thought we were going through the Spanish Inquisition again when someone left the lights on. Okay. We can take care of this. We can make this decision. So why, well, there's many reasons they're doing it, but by mandating that we use the fluorescent light bulbs, there is some company that is going to benefit, a particular company, okay, over in China, or probably a U.S. company with operations in China. That's crony capitalism. We see crony capitalism again with the health care bill. I want a waiver, okay, and once they start telling me the criteria, but that's pretty secret, uh, I could apply for a waiver. Some states are getting it, some companies are getting it, and others are not. That's crony capitalism. The last one I'm going to talk about today is ignoring, flat out ignoring and diminishing the legal process. Remember that when you diminish the rule of law, you put the authority back into the king. And that's what's happening when we see the administration, you know, perfectly flagrantly ignoring injunctions to allow drilling in Louisiana, just ignoring it, and when they finally conceded to it, this is the slowest approval process you can imagine. So they're ignoring it in practice, if not in effect. Or we see this dilly-dallying with the legality of the health care bill. If you believe in the rule of law, then you subject this bill to evaluation by the Supreme Court on a very speedy track. But they're gonna dilly-dally and there's nothing else I can call it because they don't want to be subject to the rule of law. So folks, when I was writing this and I was thinking so many different things to give you as an examples, I got depressed. <laughs> but as I stand here and see you, I'm so happy. And I know that you know we need a smaller government, not a particular government. I just want a tiny one at this local, state, and federal level. And I'll work with you to get that done. Thank you. I still can't believe there are professors at San Jose State who think like that. I'm very pleased. Uh, outstanding. Uh, Professor Lydia Ortega.